Hello and welcome to Almost 30 Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. Thanks for being here. Sending you loving vibrations Loving today. vibes. That's all we are. I was just thinking that. I'm like, okay, we're getting started. How can I bring a loving energy through from my voice and intentional energy <laughs> to our amazing audience? <laughs> Sounds like my, you know, like when teachers have very specific voices, like uh-huh. to capture the attention of uh-huh. the youngins. Hello. Good morning. Yes. How is everybody? I was thinking there's someone that's coming on that I really admire, who I'm very excited about. And it's someone that, um, like a teacher for me, but they don't know it. Um, much like uh, Julie was, you know, for a long time listening to her on Rich. But she talks quite a bit about voices. Mm. She's like, there's some voices I cannot, you know, just can't, can't, it's not an alignment for me vibrationally. So I was like, we must be a vibrational voice alignment, baby. <laughs> like I keep thinking that. I'm like, yes, the voice is a vibrational alignment. But think about think about someone's voice where like if you are everyone, everyone's intuitive, everyone picks up on mm-hmm. picks up on things. But I feel like through the voice, you're picking up on the emotional body. You're picking up on stuck energy. You're picking up on so much whether you like can translate it or not, I don't think is important, but there's like a feeling you get when you hear someone's voice. And I'm the exact same way. I'm like, ooh, I can't. Because even knowing ours, you know, I know when I listen, that says so much about how I'm feeling. Yes. If I'm in my body, if I'm not in my body, if there's a stuck emotion there, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? People Mm -hmm. can even hear... Like yesterday when I was talking to you, it's like we were talking off the air. It was like there was a stuck emotion Mm -hmm. when it was emotional. It's like it was good emotional, but it's like you know that there's more. Yes. And then there's also when you're tired, when you're excited, when you need to take a breath. Like it's just very – it's interesting because we use our voices with the podcast as an instrument, but I never thought that that would be like my mode Mm -hmm. of, of expression, I guess. Yeah. Well, I didn't know how how much my voice could change over time yeah. and also like how I always felt like at the mercy of my voice just because I used it for like singing and whatnot. And I was always like, oh, it has to be a certain condition and perfect and um, to kind of know exactly what affects one's voice is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Like not just drinking or not just not getting enough sleep. It's like there's so many layers to it. This is not a voice episode, so. So we're just (laughs) ripping and ranting. I did want to say, so it was so funny. um, I've been talking a lot about empath, like the empath Mm -hmm. and the empath work. So if you're an empath, highly recommend you listening to my episodes that I've done on the empath. I'm someone that identifies as an empath, um, seeking to be a more conscious empath. So I'm someone that is very in tune, but you want to always stay in your power. And an empath is someone that just really feels beyond what is considered normal, whether it's extrasensory or whether it's um, an environment or whether it's an emotion or feeling from someone else. It's just someone that is like an extreme feeler. And then we have our TikTok page, Almost 30 Podcast TikTok page. And then we have our YouTube and we've been doing YouTube shorts. Mm -hmm. The comments from random men (laughs) have have been, they're like, I knew an empath once. She was psychotic. (laughs) And like it is, it is so wild because I'm really seeing wow. recently the and because I've been talking a lot about empath work, feminism, femininity, um, and that sort of range where it's a little risky. Mm-hmm. Empath work is not as much, but just seeing how men are responding has been so funny. Like there's been like probably like seven or eight comments I've seen from men specific to the empath work that are like women are so crazy. They're so emotional. And they just blah, blah. Like it's been like the fear of that That's mystical part of the woman or that feeling part of the woman has been so apparent. It wow. is so fascinating. Wow. With its roots for them, probably in their childhood for where sure. they, you know. Shut it off. Yeah. But it's also the unknown. It's like, oh, if she knows, oh, this is what it was. This is what it was. I had a clip on TikTok where I was talking about how empaths usually know things, Mm -hmm. you know, empaths are very intuitive. Um, And I was saying, (laughs) I just made the joke, all of my ex-boyfriends have never been able to get anything past me because I've always known. And that was what set everyone off, Mm -hmm. all the men off. They were like, women are so crazy. They think that they know. 
and they're just psychos. Like they're just, it was so <laughs> aggressive and so dismissive about a woman's intuition. Wow. It was, it was wild to see. Wow. There's nothing, there's nothing more sexy when like a guy, a man or a masculine like bows down to the woman's intuition. Yes. And like surrenders to it because it is so powerful. And like men have intuition too, but you know, rather than fight it and be super triggered by it. But I'm sure, you know, it's like kind of looking at their mother stuff and like all of that, you know, the female. Well, it's just funny because I was talking about men cheating in particular, how I've always had these like weird intuitive. It's also like fear, you know, it's also like I cheated too. So I I cheated too. It's also projection. (laughs) Yeah, literally. It was also everything. So it's not even just being an empath, but it was just like right when they said that it's like when women know something that a man doesn't want them to know there's like that fear of it. But it's, it's so, it was such an interesting experience. I'm like, wow, I didn't know that this would be triggering for people, for men, you know, Mm -hmm. random men that Mm -hmm. exist online. And they listened to the whole episode or was it Uh, a short? Of course, it was just the perfect amount for them under 15 seconds. I was like, wait. (laughs) Enough for them to make a comment, enough for them to know, enough for them to think, like, it's like hilarious. Yeah, me picturing like, people sitting at their computers all day just going mm-hmm. through YouTube shorts. I get it. It's painful. Very sad. Very, yeah, <laughs> it's very, especially as someone's as a stranger. I know. Like that they don't know. I know. Bless. You did answer them though, right? I did. I said, yeah. hey, I want to tell you something. <laughs> I took an hour of my day and I said, hey, sir. <laughs> Excuse me. Even like, even to comment and respond with love, is just too much energy for me. Too much. You know, even if I was to say, hey, love and blessings to you is just too much energy Mm -hmm. for me. Not that they don't deserve love because they very much do. The perpetrators need love the most. That's true. As I always say, but um, you just kind of have to move on. But it reminded me of the fear of men of women's power. And a lot of their power is that intuition, that psychic ability, that Mm -hmm. mysticism. Um, And Julie, you know, Julie Pye at Trimati on the episode on almost 30 for a second time Mm -hmm. is such a great example of that. Yeah, I love her so much. There's just an intentionality with the way that she lives, that she practices, that she creates, that she loves and nurtures that is like really powerful. Like you feel it even as, you know, friends of hers and we don't see her obviously all the time, but it's just, it's felt even in the short time that we spend with her. Yes, so she is a mystic mother, musician, artist, chef, author, and healer who has really lived her life immersed in devotion and expansive creativity. She is a very powerful way shower. Um, Her episodes with her husband, Rich Roll, who's also been on the podcast, are some of my favorites. I Mm -hmm. love their honesty, their integrity, their deep conversations. It's really beautiful because over the years, I mean, I think Rich has had his podcast for um, eight or nine years now, longer than ours. Um, maybe 10 by this point. And to see the evolution of their journey through the episodes has been so beautiful to see because they'll come together and they'll talk about the season. They'll be like, oh, in this season, we're actually not, you know, spending a lot of time together. I'm really aligned with my art. You know, Julie will really be immersed in whatever she's creating, whether it's Water Tiger, her podcast, or Shrimu, you know, her various things, or Rich will be very immersed in what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they'll have periods where it's like, you know, they're very immersed in each other and they're kind of coming back. And you'll just see this really unique, you get this really unique opportunity to get insight into the journey of a long marriage. Yes. And the seasons that really happen within it, especially with children. Yes. And just the seasons of them as individuals, it's really, it's a reminder for me, like, you know, we're, if you're out there listening, I'm sure you're in your twenties or thirties or forties. And, you know, I think sometimes we can get caught up in this, this feeling or perception that like, okay, if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. Or if we don't create it now, if we don't, whatever, achieve it now, after a certain point, we won't do it. And that may or may not be true. But what I love to observe in Julie and her her journey is like so much of what she's created. She's created after like four kids. Okay. (laughs) Like it's Mm -hmm. crazy. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. she's just, she, she doesn't allow, she allows age to be a power. She allows like the wisdom and the ever growing, you know, well of wisdom to 
be a super powerful motor in her creation. And she doesn't allow like the fact, I don't even know how old Julia, she told us in the first interview, but um, mm-hmm. I don't even think of it as age, yeah. right? And she's just such a powerhouse in that way. And also it's like so easeful from as a bystander. I'm like, yeah, okay, she's creating like this incredible, you know, vegan cheese brand mm-hmm. made of nuts and it's beautiful and it's a work of art. And- mm-hmm. Yeah, the we in the first episode talked a little bit about Trimu the intentionality behind it, but there's levels to this. Mm -hmm. And it's so powerful when I'll have access to, or you'll have access to these people that are tapped into the deeper levels of frequency or spirituality or intentionality. Mm -hmm. You know, there's having recyclable packaging. Maybe you have a give back component. Mm -hmm. You know, there's levels to entrepreneurship and to how deep you can go. And I think we've been mindful about that. There's always more for us to do. But when you run a business and you are an entrepreneur, there's so many opportunities for you, especially because you're exchanging money yes. to make change and to make a difference. And with Shrimu, it's just so powerful. And I remember years ago listening to episodes because I bought Plant Power Way, the book, because I've been plant-based for a long time. I've been vegetarian since I was 18, and I've been plant-based for a while. And it was a book that I never made a recipe from because I've never made a recipe in my whole life. <laughs> but I deeply enjoyed the energetics behind. Yeah. <laughs> I deeply was like, like I love looking at the pictures. I love the pictures. I just love the energy of it. I'm like, this is a beautiful family that is cooking these beautiful things. <laughs> and I just appreciated it so much. The recipes are unbelievable. Mm. They're like unbelievable. But I remember years ago when she was talking about making cheese and a lot of the books she makes really powerful, beautiful cheese. This cheese is nuts. Um, and Shrimu is just a company that has this mission of offering really delicious, high-end, artisanal, plant-based, plant-based not cheeses. Um, and she really sees it as this transmission of life frequency, which can really connect us to this greater mission of a higher path for our bodies by having this like more mindful way to eat a not cheese, um, our animals and our planet. Um, Both Rich and Julie are plant-based and I really admire their plant-based journey. And for me, a not cheese or, you know, a nut cheese is just so delicious and Mm. rich and I feel really good after it. Mm. I know for most people that really love cheese, they're like cheese lovers and they just become cheese addicts. There's actually components in cheese that are addictive. I've read studies on the addictive qualities of cheese but it's felt like it's really hard. Like it really just stuffs you up digestion wise. Mm, Especially, I mean, if it's not organic, if it's not, you know, like raw cheese is different. Like most cheese out there is super processed and super gross. (laughs) And she has incredible employees that Mm -hmm. are all really intentional. They're setting this environment for a beautiful frequency to be infused in the food. Um, we all know how good it feels to be served a m- meal by someone who created the meal with love and by someone that really loves us. It's that like beautiful moment where you could have a meal with your family or someone that's created you, you know, something with intention. And Shri Mu is that. It has these artisanal not cheeses that are really intentional and beautiful. And I do love how they're more supportive of the planet and of mm-hmm. animals. Absolutely. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's delicious. Be sure to check them out. They are a new partner of the show, mm-hmm. which we're so excited about. And it's so, so aligned. So thank you, Julie, for joining us. Enjoy this episode with Julie Pyatt. You can also listen to her on Almost 30 by searching Julie Pyatt Almost 30. You can mm-hmm. listen to her husband, Rich Roll, by searching Rich Roll. We appreciate you. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy this and we'll see you on the other side. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Little known fact about me, I grew up with eczema most of my life. It was something that was incredibly uncomfortable. I remember when I was younger, I had to wear socks over my hands when I slept because I would scratch so much in my sleep. Mm. I would be bleeding. It just was so painful and uncomfortable. So I know what it's like to have eczema. And I remember anything that I put on my skin always had steroids it never really felt like it was the cleanest or the most healthy for me. So I'm really glad to be working with a company called Glad Skin to provide relief without steroids. It really helps to provide good bacteria to your skin microbiome to stop the itch and redness, to tame your inflammation, and really help your skin heal. 
So if you suffer with acne, with eczema, with rosacea, glad skin is for you. So I actually have not, but I have people in my family who have been suffering with eczema as well as rosacea. I have been acne prone, as you all know. So glad skin uses Micreo Balance. This is a revolutionary protein that restores the balance of the good and bad bacteria that live on your skin so it can finally heal. It is so effective that 91% of users, adults and children who tried their top selling eczema cream reported significant improvement after just seven days. And again, this is steroid free. So this is for children. This is for adults. Um, and they have actually a baby formula. Gladskin's new oatmeal free formula is non-toxic and free of steroids and other common irritants. Uh, pediatricians and dermatologists love Gladskin for every little I little wish I one. would have had this. I know. My life would be so different. <laughs> my little skin. So if you've been frustrated with your treatment options, don't wait to try Glad Skin. They are offering our listeners 15% off plus free shipping on your first order at gladskin.com slash almost 30. That's G-L-A-D-S-K-I-N dot com slash almost 30. That's gladskin.com slash almost 30 for 15% off plus free shipping. It is fall season, and I'm so grateful that I have daily harvest so I can eat more seasonally. It's felt good to have in my freezer things that I can warm up during the day, during the weekend that feel really nourishing in my body. I'm a huge fan in fall time of their soups. I actually really love their tomato and zucchini minestrone. I can eat it in the afternoon. I feel light. I feel refreshed. I feel nourished, and it's so easy to make. Add a flatbread to the soup situation. Yes. Whenever Lindsay comes to work together, we make flatbreads. <laughs> so I love their artichoke and spinach flatbread. I also love their um, sweet potato and kale. It's so yummy. So what I love about Daily Harvest is they flash freeze fresh fruits and vegetables. And there are these meals like harvest bowls, soups, flatbreads, snacks, smoothies, lattes that are made with organic fruits and vegetables. And you feel like you have a private chef coming out of your freezer. And the best part for me is that I'm not wasting food. Mm -hmm. So it's in my freezer until I want it. And it takes only a few minutes to prepare. So I'll dump a harvest bowl into a pan, add a little olive oil, and it's ready in like six minutes. So if you're someone who is busy getting back into the swing of things for fall, highly, highly recommend Daily Harvest. So of course, we got you, Almost 30 listeners. You can go to dailyharvest.com slash almost 30 for up to $40 off your first box. That's dailyharvest.com slash almost 30. recently had on Shervin, the founder of Symbiotica. Y'all, this episode broke the internet on IG, on TikTok, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. Y'all are freaking out. And for good reason, I am absolutely just so enthralled with this brand. They are so meticulous in their quality, their sourcing. They're developing these products for years. Uh, This is a health supplement company, if you don't know, and they are designing sophisticated organic formulations that are scientifically proven to increase vitality and longevity by filling nutritional gaps that result from our modern day diet. So we live in a time where our soils are depleted. There are toxins in more things than I I'd like to really admit to myself and they are sourcing the highest quality bioavailable ingredients and the most advanced delivery system. Uh, most of their supplements are liposomal delivery, which I, I love. This is my preferred way to take supplements. I just wanted to shout out some of my favorite products that maybe you would like, uh, but I highly recommend just perusing their website. I love their liposomal vitamin C. It's derived from non-GMO L-ascorbic acid. And to create the perfect synergy, they added bamboo silica, one of nature's most beautifying minerals required for collagen production, normal cell function, and strong connective tissue. So this is going to support healthy aging. It's going to boost your collagen production um, and your immune system is going to be supported as well. I also love the liposomal vitamin D3 and K2 and CoQ10. So this comes in a bottle, but then I squirt it in my mouth. I do 
12 pumps a day. It contains the highest quality plant-based um, materials essential for activating over 3,000 genes associated with longevity. D3 is critical for regulating the absorption of calcium and phosphorus, two minerals that play a key role in the strength and density of our teeth and skeletal system. And this formula may also help promote mental clarity and support normal blood clotting while increasing energy levels. Uh, so this is going to support your immune health, uh, strong bones, supports cardiovascular health by reducing arterial plaque. So these are my top two supplements. I am also, last but not least, really obsessed with Shilajit. So this is a plant-based mineral resin that contains over 84 essential minerals and fulvic acid and offers numerous health benefits. It's a super antioxidant that improves memory and immunity, anti-inflammatory, and it's an energy booster. So this is great to uh, replace your coffee in the morning, but you can create your own custom bundle subscription and get 15% off your purchase, okay? This is in addition to custom bundle discounts. So if you do a custom bundle subscription, you can get up to 45% off when you use code ALMOST30. I wouldn't wait on this. Go to symbiotica.com. That's C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A, symbiotica.com, and use the code ALMOST30 at checkout. We're about to start the fall season and no better way to start a season than by committing to something that's really good for your mental, emotional, physical health. And therapy has been incredibly supportive for my mental and emotional health. Honestly, I think it affects my physical too. I'll say it. I've been in therapy for about four years now and it's been the best investment I've ever made in myself, period, the end. Um, I tell everyone, I'm like... If you don't, if you feel like you don't need a therapist, y'all, we all deserve a therapist. Do you know what I mean? Just to have someone to talk to um, and to really have that support on a weekly or biweekly basis, even once a month. And I recommend BetterHelp. So this is a way you can do virtual online therapy and they match you with a licensed therapist. Okay. And you can always change if you're like, Hey, this is, this one's not for me. They make it super, super easy to change. I just love how they do it online. And for a lot of us, it's easier to do it online. It's more convenient. It fits into our schedule. I I don't want the excuse of, oh, I can't go to the office. We can do this online and it's more affordable than traditional online therapy. Okay. So you can visit betterhelp.com slash almost 30 today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash almost 30. You're going to get 10% off your first month. So grateful you're here. I'm so Re- grateful to be here. Round two, baby. Yeah. And I was just Amazing. praying for um, all of the conversation energies that we're going to kind of bring through. And I'm really excited because you've been such a mentor just watching you and witnessing you. And even this weekend, I was talking with Lindsay who had her wedding. I know. I saw that. It was I'm freaking out. Oh it my was gosh. beautiful. It was so much energy. And there's, you know, not many times in your life where there's moments that profound. Of course. And so you're just like fully immersed in it. But we were talking about how grateful we've been to witness you and Rich sort of just come to the microphone every couple months mm. and like dig in on your mm. on your relationship in a really real and authentic way and the seasons that you're in. And that's something that I really admire about you is the ability to allow the seasons of your life. Mm-hmm. And I'm really curious about what you would label, you know, to bring us to the present moment and bring our audience to the present moment of where you are now energetically. What would you what would you call or how would you explain the season of your life? Wow, that's profound. Thank you yes. so much for that. Um, yeah, it's been an amazing journey and uh, certainly uh, not one that we, you know, we didn't plan this in advance that we would be doing that. But there is something really profound, as you know, and as you know, many podcast listeners know, that happens when you turn the mic on. And, you know, I joke but I'm not really joking Mm. that it's the best thing for a marriage is to (laughs) launch a podcast (laughs) because when, I mean, you're busy in life. So (sighs) when are you, when do you have time Mm -hmm. to really sit down and really dig in? Mm -hmm. And even that's been something that we've been talking about is why is that the deepest time (laughs) that we, (laughs) that we connect? Um, But I would say it's interesting that you said seasons. Um, I just turned 60 in July 
and um, never thought that would happen in this <laughs> earthly life. Thought I would be long dead by now. Wow. Um, so I'm not somebody who, um, I don't identify with aging or with, you know, like for, there's some aspect of me that I'm, I'm like, this just is not right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I think it's because I have a connection to a multidimensional aspect in realms where we 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 don't experience the death program. So the death mm-hmm. program is a super imposition on this planetary realm. But I'm getting too far out there for Rich and my relationship. So let me go back to just the basics. We'll go back um, to death program. <laughs> we'll go back to death program yes. after this. But um, a season I would say is that we have cu- we have cured. We have mm. come into a refinement. And within that refinement, um, it is, uh, it's like an embodiment or, or an alignment that still isn't complete. Like that, like, you know, uh, my conversations with Rich recently are, you know, what are we hiding? What are we still hiding? Mm -hmm. Because we're all hiding something. We, we haven't been able to fully come into that Mm -hmm. blossoming in for different reasons. Um, So that's sort of something that we're processing right now and approaching our relationship. You know, I said to him recently, you know, I have never and will never accomplish or I would say experience such a profound uh, effect in a relationship as I have with him. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's quite profound because we're very, very different people. We're like, we're like from two different ends of the spectrum coming together and by some force that is beyond us. And yet there's a huge, you know, bed of love, like foundation field of love and deep friendship Mm -hmm. and also attraction and, um, you know, humor, you know, there, there's lots of things in it, but I guess, um, where we are right now is, is we've been together over 20 years, um, raised four kids, gone through all kinds of life experiences, deaths and financial collapse and, you know, building our dreams, committing to a devotional life. And now, you know, we're, we're sitting here and there's another 20 on the deck mm-hmm. and we've already digested that story. That Julian Rich that is in Finding Ultra has already been digested, and so the question is, uh, my big question of the of the of the day is, how do you want to evolve? Because it's all about evolution. So, how are we coming into relationship with each other, and how is our relationship going to expand, shift, um, change, morph? into a different, you know, a new, a new rebirth of that relationship. And the thing that's really, um, comforting, or I feel, I feel well about, and not just in our relationship, but in others relationships, because I think all of us, you guys are listening, we're all in that evolution right now, wherever you are. And this is not like any other time in history. It's not like, oh, this is a cycle and blah, blah. No, no. This is a planetary procession where we are morphing and changing and becoming more of who we are, which is actually a multidimensional life form that lives in simultaneous space time. Mm -hmm. So if you consider that, um, and if you've had a relationship or you've had the blessing of of having love in your life, Mm -hmm. you know, in whatever form, um, that is a great privilege. And the reasons that we are evolving today are not for um, kindergarten human issues. So it's not about seeing a shorter skirt, you know, or a better looking man or, um, you know, infidelity Mm -hmm. for the, for the reasons that humans usually, you know, these patterns repeat. This is something very big and it's about the higher self, um, sort of coming and merging and sitting inside of us. And, you know, you asked me before when we were walking in here, like what's been on your your mind and what's been on my, my heart is this process of walk-in. But what is a walk, you know, it can be a walk-in mm-hmm. on many different levels, but I have been witnessing in my own community 
within friends, a new energy is there. And it's not the situation where they don't know who they are. You know, it's not that, but it's, it could be that in some cases, but there is a presence that has arrived that is here. And it's a much, um, I don't want to say older, but I would say it's why it's wiser. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's with this knowledge, this ancient knowledge, this remembrance of, you know, sort of the greater you mm -hmm. or the over soul. And so that's been really, really profound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, you know, Rich and I are in that moment right now, which has brought a beautiful intimacy to be um, sharing on that level, mm -hmm. you know? So, and I, what I want to also share is, you know, it is always mm -hmm. the treasure of communication. If you can uh, have the courage to communicate, then it just, uh, it breeds intimacy, deep intimacy and connection and friendship. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like um, we all are going, you know, all of us are going. So it's not about uh, creating separation, which is what the controller paradigm wants to put on us and every breath and everything that we're looking at. So it's always, how can we soften? How can we soften and invite and become curious and, and really devoted to the relationships that we've had up into this moment? And, you know, let's just say it was all by design. It was all meant to be the way it was. So it isn't an us and them or, you know, this side's right and that mm -hmm. side's wrong. There's no side. There's a billion different life forms with a billion different perspectives. And so one of the things that I was speaking about at my birthday, I had a, a party and I lit a ceremonial fire, which was quite amazing. Um, I sort of um, gathered everyone and they were all you know, sort of not suspecting that I was going to do that. And I was speaking about um, starting to invite the part of yourself that has been in the mystery. Mm -hmm. And if you knew that your future self was coming to meet you, what are the things that you would prepare? Mm -hmm. Like, would you prepare? Is there something left undone? Is there something you want to refine? I mean, it's beyond, you know, cleaning out a drawer, but it's sort of, you could use that mm -hmm. as a metaphor. Um, but I asked everybody to, so I spoke of this sort of uh, condition, mm -hmm. this, this movement that's happening, um, because this isn't going to be like any other time. It's a new moment of evolution. So I told everyone that um, they could turn their phones on to film the fire um, because I was presenting the fire as this living deity. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have known for eons of time how to commune with the fire. So the fire is a living being. And with our intentions, um, and I asked for blessings and expansions for each person in the proportion that was appropriate for them. And so they all had their phones up and then they filmed. There was actually beings of different colors mm -hmm. following me around the fire and a huge being in the smoke with like a form, like they were freaking mm -hmm. out. And I was just not freaking out. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes. Um, but um, <laughs> you're like boring. <laughs> well, the thing is, is, and this is another thing that mm -hmm. I'd love to dive into yes. with you is, so, you know, there's all these well, it depends on which circles you run in, but, you know, these ideas of, you know, at that future time, then mm -hmm. it's going to be like this. And mm -hmm. when we arrive, it's mm -hmm. going to be like this. But actually in my experience in, you know, many lifetimes of spiritual pursuits, when that thing happens, that extraordinary thing that happens that you've been meditating, that you've been really, you know, wanting or desiring, it always happens when you least suspect mm -hmm. it. It all always happens mm -hmm. in the moment that is just ridiculous. It's annoying. It's annoying. <laughs> yep. But the thing is, is that when it happens, it is completely natural. Mm -hmm. So it's as if the wind blew across your cheek. It's not amazing. It's mm -hmm. not. So when those things have happened to me, um, and because I'm a mystic and live my life in that way, life speaks to me in that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's very natural mm -hmm. and it's uh, grounded. Mm -hmm. and 
And so that that was why I wasn't rushing over to, mm. you know, freak out with all of them. But it was cute. I mean, it was cool. Yes. And I've had that happen in recent ceremonies. You were talking about Lucy's mm-hmm. shoot mm-hmm. for my birthday. Beautiful. So Lucy Pinter picks on Instagram. Um Your I just sorry. Yeah. I just, you know, she didn't even have a public feed. Oh I was my. like, girl, like, could you please? like step into the arena. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she's like all these famous photographers that are like war journalists, like the, like, Mm -hmm. you know, the really, really amazing ones, which I don't, I don't know their names. Mm -hmm. They're all following her. She's like, they're following me. I go, yes, Mm -hmm. because that's the level you're shooting at. But anyway, so she did this beautiful shoot for my, my birthday, my 60th birthday nudes, which was amazing. But I was, I was in Paris with her the month before and um, we went to Mont Saint Michel, which mm. is this amazing sort of city that rises up on this island like out of nothing, right? Mm. And so I was going there to do spiritual planetary grid work. Mm-hmm. And she's sort of skeptical and scrappy. And <clears throat> she was suspect suspect of me. I had to sort of you know, say you're going to be my best friend and you don't know it yet, but we'll go through some (laughs) stages to get there. So, um, when we went, we, I built a spiral and I had some technology from Dom and her, which I activated the spiral in this very profound way. And then, um, you know, she's having her own transformation. And I said, go ahead and walk in and do your thing. And she was complete. And then Mm -hmm. I went in and at the very end, I, I sealed it and I lifted my hands up to the sky and she was supposed to photograph it. Like Mm -hmm. that was her gig. She's the photographer. And all of a sudden, all at once, the sand started flying. The birds went crazy. The the thunder cracked, the rain poured, Mm -hmm. the wind. She could not stop laughing. She was, she was laughing so hard. (laughs) She's like, I missed every bit of it (laughs) because I didn't know what to grab. (laughs) And then we ran inside the city and all these nuns were drenched and we were in the cafe. She still couldn't stop laughing. I mean, I think she laughed for 30 minutes after it happened. And again, I was in that very sort of just neutral Mm -hmm. spot. And she said to me, you know, I think maybe you should apologize to them. But it wasn't for me. It was given to her. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a proof connected to the elements that is beyond denial. Mm -hmm. So even though, and listen, I have a skeptical mind too. Like Mm -hmm. I question everything. Mm -hmm. I I say, don't believe anything until Mm -hmm. you have it verified. But anyway, that's just a little, little anecdote about, about that. So I am seeing this awakening happening Mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't matter if you know this about spirituality or you belong to this camp or you studied this, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's a universal awakening that is going to happen in whatever way that cosmic mother force can get in. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't matter Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So that, that natural occurrence is what I feel coming. Mm -hmm. And it's such a relief, Mm -hmm. like it's such a relaxing Mm -hmm. place to be. I remember in 2020, it was like March. It was right when things were going down. I had this like vision and it was like, just the most excited I've ever been from a soul level. It was like, yes, here we go. You know, like, Mm -hmm. here's why I'm here. And it makes me emotional thinking about it because it was just so profound. But there's so much that you said. And I think the through line that I'm sort of getting that I'm curious about and I want to explore for myself and for the audience is what is the balance even in relationship with self or with the divine or with your evolution? What's the balance between the doing and the being? Mm -hmm. You know, when we think about your relationship with Rich and sort of the evolution that you bring forth within your relationship, the offering of evolution between the both of you or um, the evolution that you bring through from a soul level. What is your balance of that? Like, when are you, when are you being and when are you sort of offering like the next step or like a, an invite to move forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Um, I think the being is always the being. Mm -hmm. So the doing comes from the being. Mm -hmm. And it's this, it's a really important, it's a, it's an important subject. I'm really glad you asked that question because I had some, some, uh, people asking me some questions about that. And I I don't think they had quite understood for me Mm -hmm. in my life, devotion has been the thing that is the, the balancing force. Mm. It is the safety valve. It is the, um, the protection against uh, ego out of control. Mm-hmm. 
Um, it is the um, sort of solve to the mental thinking that it's so smart or the ego thinking that it's so has it all together. And the thing is, is that as we awaken, you know, there will be many amazing things that happen. Like before it used to be like, you know, oh, I was thinking of my mom and she called me. Now I'm like have whole conversations in in meditation and then I'll go look at my phone and the exact communication is there. I mean, that's just a little thing. That's mm -hmm. not that, that's not that's that profound. amazing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot of things that are going to start happening. And the thing is, is that um, I met a young person who's highly spiritually connected, a, a lovely, lovely young man with a pure heart. And he's suffering terribly because he said, you know, I'm here and I'm not seeing anyone changing. Mm. And, you know, he, he can't connect with the, with the culture. And I said to him, how's your devotional practice? Mm. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, do you think consciousness or God or creation is counting on you to like solve this whole thing? Mm -hmm. Like you just have to be in density and constriction and you're not finding joy and love. I was like, Lo love, celebrate, enjoy. We're here to create. We're in mm -hmm. the world of form. Mm -hmm. Like that's who we are. So, and then, and then also um, other individuals who have these sort of, uh, maybe other senses that are awakening, then they become like sort of focused intellectually, like mm -hmm. let's go after this faction. Let's go after it. I'm like, whoa, whoa. I'm like, here, let me get on my knees and just put my hands <laughs> over my head. Like we go look at a tree, right? That well, the devotion. So I do a lot, you know, mm -hmm. you know, if I showed you actually happy new year, it's the spiritual new year happy today. New year. It's the actual new year today. Beautiful. So if you saw the things that my map of what I'm looking mm -hmm. at, I mean, it's crazy how many things that I am that that are on the deck for me to actualize while I'm in a body. Mm -hmm. Many, many things. So it's not that I don't do, but the difference is, is that I move as a servant of the one breathing through me. And so this allows and breeds tremendous unconditional love, mm -hmm. uh, no, um, love for myself and a freeing of self-judgment and an understanding that everything is accounted for in the universal bank, call mm -hmm. it. So nobody gets away with anything. You're not getting, you're, you can't run from yourself. You can't fool yourself mm -hmm. or you can't, you know, violate yourself. It will be accounted for. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in this time space, mm -hmm. maybe in another time space. So when you start to realize the vastness of what's going on, you return to this devotion. So the devotion is embodied in who you are, connected to that source. So in the morning when I wake up, it's like this life is dedicated to the breath breathing through mm -hmm. me. And when I go to bed, this life is offered to the breath breathing through me. Not that I die when I sleep, but mm -hmm. sort of. Sort of. <laughs> but um, no, but so if you if you can do that, in my experience, mm -hmm. and because I'm a devotional being, mm -hmm. um, that solves, uh, it just keeps things, there, there's no, there's nothing to be competitive about or judge, judge another, or it, it's only, we are very individualized mm -hmm. with that source, but it's the same life living in us. It's no, it's no different. Mm -hmm. It's just the one breath. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, in yogi systems, we call it detached mm -hmm. action, but it really is the thing where you, uh, I would um, advise or guide that you align with who you are. So the real focus is on alignment. And I heard a lot on, uh, on your podcast mm -hmm. that I was listening, coming in here about manifestation. And I don't, um, use the word manifestation. Um, and that was a beautiful podcast and yeah, really of cool. Of course. No, I yeah, love really this. Cool. I love this exploration too. Yeah, yeah. But let's just mm -hmm. let's just dig into it. Yep. Because as little kindergartners, we often decide that we want to live a spiritual life because we don't want to suffer. Mm -hmm. And it's in fact, that's in fact not the way it mm -hmm. goes. Um, I'm laughing because we have to have humor. But um, so in my awareness, it's like if you can align with who you are, so something that I'm always sharing in my spiritual community, Water Tiger, is there is nothing more beautiful than a being that knows itself. 
So, I mean, I could sit here all day and we could compare, you know, eyes and nose and hair mm -hmm. and talents and body type. And, you know, there could be some sort of analysis over why you're superior or mm -hmm. I'm superior. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the, the point is, is that if you just align with who you are, mm -hmm. there's not another one of you in the entire omniverse. So if we were supposed to have consensus two of us would have been the same, but not one of mm. us is the same. Mm. So in Water Tiger or in spiritual pursuit or seeking, um, I guide to fall in love with that unique expression mm. because we all have so much separation and self-hate and judgment and talk. And so how can you really love somebody or guide somebody or hold for somebody if you have this inner judgment going on. You you really can't. So we begin with this full immersion of literally becoming your biggest advocate, your biggest lover, your biggest mother, you know, and I even, I forgot it, but I've been carrying around a beautiful picture of me when I'm six mm. and I'm in a wedding party and I am this beautiful brunette six-year-old being and I have her around me all the time mm. because I have to remind myself, because I'm a mother of four, because mm. I run multiple companies, um, that, and I'm in a relationship, that I need to um, advocate for her first, always first. So it's not anyone else. It's mm. not even my child. It's her first. And, you know, if Rich is asking me for something, it's her first. Mm. And so that union there, when you get that, that breeds um, a stability, you know, a strength and an embodiment so that I have the capacity to hold a lot of unconditional mm -hmm. love for others. But if I haven't taken care of that, I'm either in denial and I'm suppressing something mm -hmm. or, you know, I haven't fully, I say, I, I, I think this is true. If you're judging people, or you have a lot, if a, a lot of what people are doing annoy you, it's because you haven't loved yourself mm -hmm. well enough. Because if you love yourself well enough, you understand that each life form is unique. Mm -hmm. And so if you're angry, you're angry because you have not uh, been there for yourself. You have not cultivated mm -hmm. that for yourself. And then, of course, that's not the ending point because after you embody and you are aligned, then it attracts the magnetism. Mm -hmm. The manifestation is a magnetism, mm -hmm. a spontaneous <clears throat> magnetism of being embodied. Mm -hmm. And then because you're in that frequency, then you're able to um, spontaneously uh, uplift the field. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a duty, like it's not like Derek Zoolander, like, you know, I want to make a school for kids who can't read good. <laughs> It's not that. It's like just you being you mm -hmm. spontaneously with everything you desire and you love and the things that you just you just are naturally mm -hmm. expansive at. Just by your beingness, you you elevate the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and manifestation work, it's like, and that's why I love, you know, Lacey's work a lot. Cause once you get down to the deep part of it, it's it's not matrix play. You know, it's not the car or the thing. Mm. It really is the deeper alignment. And there was a point a few years ago where I was like, I want what God wants for me. You know, I don't want to, God knows better than I know for myself. And it's almost limiting. I felt like when I would put manifestations out there, I'm like, I want this or I want that. And how can I be more aligned to the divinity and the expansive opportunity that I'm provided through God? Um, but something you know, as it relates to loving yourself and really alignment, sometimes I struggle where I'm like, because we're changing so much. We just talked about the planetary shifts and the energy coming to the planet right now. We talk a lot about spiritual evolution and the multidimensional self. So how do we grasp the essence of self and then learn to be in alignment when we're changing so much and there's so much influence around us? Confusing, very confusing. 
<laughs> I was driving here today, kind of trying to feel where I was. Yes, 100%. You know, we I keep saying, in. I'm like, I have legs. They're on the ground. Like, I keep <laughs> thinking about my legs. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's, I mean, I think it's challenging yeah. right now because, you know, it, just to even imagine it, even imagine those veils coming down mm-hmm. between those other aspects of really who we are. Um, it can be um, confusing. Mm-hmm. I think the energy, particularly in the last month, mm-hmm. has been very well. It's been powerful for a lot, but mm-hmm. there's been, you know, many times I wake up, my adrenals are just fried. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. So we're we're out. We're doing other things, um, but I think also the multidimensional form for me that I um, that I share in in Water Tiger is also what keeps me alive in this incarnation. I mean, it's so expansive to understand, you know, that Mm -hmm. the reason that I wear a hat has to do with another identity and another time space, or the reason that I light fires is connected to a part of me in Mm -hmm. another time space. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to collect pieces of yourself, which are way beyond, you know, and also one thing that is up for me now is, the graduation from the birth family. Mm. So, you know, uh, we call it like false parent implant program. You know, Mm. your true parents are the cosmic father and mother. And, you know, many of us have incarnated into a lot of polarity in the birth family. Um, And so, you know, emancipation from that identity is definitely here for me Mm. now. So I'm no longer that sister or that daughter in that configuration, Mm -hmm. you know? And when your father passed. Yeah. And, um, you know, why, why now? Cause your father passed previously. Mm -hmm. So what was it? Is it just an energy that you're feeling into where you're like, okay, now moving to the divine cosmic mother as my source? Like what was the impetus now? Well, it's been, it's been that way for a long time for me. Like I've understood what the play was. Mm -hmm. I was just you know, watching the movie since I was born. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know what I just found out? What? I found out I was born in my Saturn return. What do you mean? I I had my Saturn return when I was born. You have it two or maybe three times in yes. your life. So I, wow. if you had asked me about my childhood, if yeah. you ever heard me, mm-hmm. I said it was not a happy childhood mm-hmm. and I was basically waiting to get out of the family. Mm-hmm. I mean, that they were nice enough. It's not. Mm-hmm. It's not that. Like I was, bless my mother and father, how they took care of me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just wasn't, I was from another star system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> was, uh-huh. Everyone yeah. listening. They're relates. like, yes, yes, 100%. hundred percent. But yeah, but I never even realized that I was born in my Saturn return. I was like, no wonder, yeah, like, of course, story. but also kind of good planning mm-hmm. on my, on my part. Good I mean, planning. it really, the transformational element of you and the yeah. alchemical element of you is like spot freaking <laughs> onto that. Um, Within your journey to being 60 and, you know, not really identifying with age, where do you see people getting caught up, especially women with aging and with the process and the fear around, you know, that journey? Because I think it's kind of silly, but people are like, you're brave (laughs) if you're not embracing it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So, so you've just hit on, I think the absolute core of what we get to transform as women embodied in human form right now. So thank you for asking that. One of the key things that I did uh, some years ago, maybe it's been 10 years, is I gave voice and called out that um, mind control thought form that was inside my body that was always there, always sitting there that said that after a certain age, I would be traded for a younger version. After a certain age, I would be useless to this humanity. And so I decided, and it always gave me a little bit of unease, like a little kind Mm -hmm. of unease, which was just lurking there in everything. And then I decided that I was going to uh, shamanically remove it from myself and you can't always do this, but mm-hmm. I did it very effectively. So I'm, I do healing work and I did like a multidimensional sort of ceremony and I removed it and I rescinded participation with that lie. And I use the Vedic texts, um, that state and a, a monk, uh, Swami Vidya Dishananda, um, who shared with me that the most prolific time in a woman's life 
in the Vedas is after childbearing years. Mm. So it's when we come into all of our wisdom and power and Shakti and creativity, yet our culture has lied to us and told Mm -hmm. us the opposite because this is in the suppression of the feminine, which started thousands of years ago, um, where we were burned at the stake. The feminine frequency was ripped out of the spiritual history of our planet Mm -hmm. and all the teachings. And then that went along into political systems Mm -hmm. and the culture and businesses. And we're all just saying, yeah, yeah, we all, we've all experienced this violence. Um, Literally, we've been annihilated physically in other lifetimes, mm-hmm. like had brut- brutal things happen, mm-hmm. maybe also in this lifetime, definitely sexual abuse mm-hmm. and uh, predatory um, behaviors. And we've just been suppressed. It's sort of like a disease of the culture that just naturally does it. And it happens in this automatic sense. So freeing ourselves from that lie is something that I am sharing a lot right now. Um, the second thing is, though, uh, I was at one of my uh, one of my investors in Shrimu is a humanitarian woman, humanitarian woman named Lekka Singh, and um, she had her first photographic exhibit of Indigenous women mm-hmm. in Paris, which is why I was in Paris. Mm-hmm. So I went to uh, Le Musée de l'Homme, uh, and she had this exquisite um, exhibit of women who carry the world. So it were photographs of all these women mm. who walk or travel, you know, many, many miles twice a day to get water or, you know, a kindling for the fire for their families. And they go completely unnoticed or ever recognized, you know, the burden of mm. life on these beautiful goddesses. Um, so when I was at her event, I actually met one of her guests was a woman samurai from a female Japanese order. She had been initiated from the Mm. age of six by her grandmother. And this radiant, beautiful, beautiful woman, it was profound. Lucy was with me, Mm. photographed her. Um, But um, one thing that stuck with me was she was talking about in the lineage how the feminine is so powerful and literally Mm. is the orchestrator of all things that she's completely silent. Like you don't even, you don't even know. Like she's so powerful and so badass mm-hmm. that, that you don't even, like she's not even necessarily seen. Mm-hmm. And I was reflecting on the contrast in our culture mm-hmm. um, that is coming from a completely reversed way. And so sometimes when I've been observing myself, like I'll give details. <laughs> that are highlighting, you know, things that I have created or have expressed in my life that get accredited to men. Mm. And so, but then I kind of view myself and I'm like, there, there's two things that are in there. There's the implant that says that if you're a beautiful woman or mm-hmm. a kind woman or an embodied woman, that you wouldn't do such a thing. Mm. You wouldn't speak up and say, you know, hey, I built that house, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. or whatever it is, mm-hmm. right? So there's that. And then part of me, I was like, you know, and, and in my life, if, if anybody ever said, you know, well, why do you have to say it? And I said, well, I have to say it because you haven't given me the, the respect, mm-hmm. the honor. So I have to, I have to correct it. I have to speak up. So I think I'm hopeful of a time <laughs> when this all balances out when we reclaim and women come into roles of guiding this planet. Mm. So benevolent leaders, guides, this is what my work is focused on Mm. going forward, the empowerment of women, but to really, really embody who they are and remember that we are the leaders. We are the holders, the keeper of the flame. We know how to guide, how to lead. And this is whether you given birth to children or you haven't given birth to children, or let's say you're in a masculine form, but you're very embodied in your feminine. But this feminine is here now and she is coming into position. And once we are reclaimed and embodied in that, the masculine takes the place beside her because it is both energies that are needed. So I was really reflecting on that and understanding that 
you know, many times I like to be hidden, you know, mm-hmm. I align with this, I'm a water tiger. Mm-hmm. It's the year of the water tiger this year. But sometimes I go into mystery. Mm-hmm. I go in the, d- the dark. I don't want anybody to know mm-hmm. where I am. And then, but then I'm a tiger and I have the stripes. So I want to be, you know, on the stage. Mm-hmm. So it's, it was interesting to see that like at a pure form, mm-hmm. you know, that, that lineage had al- always been led by the women and to see uh, how that would be, that will relax more also through the cultural change you know, we've had women acting like men, Mm -hmm. you know, out of survival because they're trying to get in the game and trying to be seen. And I mean, I have, I have really dear friends that are very powerful business women of hundred million dollar companies plus, and they all are still experiencing misogyny in, Mm -hmm. in their companies. I mean, it's just everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think that it's for us to reclaim that. It is up to us to rewrite. All of this is not true. It was never Mm -hmm. true. It was an agenda that was reversed Mm -hmm. to suppress the light we hold, the wisdom we hold, the knowledge we hold, the creativity, and the the capacity to lead, to guide, Mm -hmm. to love. This is within every every feminine frequency, Mm -hmm. every pure heart. I think for a lot of people, and you spoke to it, it's, and this is what I'm really working on with my community and in my life is unlearning the idea of the feminine that relates to capitalism and that relates to capitalism in the way where we're seeing um, the promotion or being CEO or the burnout or like this idea that to be equal, we must be like the masculine. So I'd love to explore and hear from you, you know, what are some practices that our audience can take and whatever, however they express in their balance of masculine and feminine is unique to their essence. And I believe that each person has their own, you know, unique formula. So it might be different, but what are some feminine practices that feel really like the healing of the feminine to allow the energetics that will come forward in their life? Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, for me, the most powerful is, is being in the mirror naked. Mm -hmm. That's just it, you know, and, and full really, length. Uh, full length, sure. Full length, okay. Even uh, oftentimes I just light a candle and just be naked and just sit down mm-hmm. and just really, really commune and really digest and understand that the feminine or, and, 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 and existentially, well, um, you would say it's the magic, mm-hmm. the mystic. Um, but also the eternal creator, Mm -hmm. eternally creating Mm -hmm. forever. So um, it's just understanding that that is not, um, this paradigm is is falling. Um, And again, it was all by design, so it's all fine. But now it's about um, really uh, embodying that magnetism, you know, through Mm -hmm. the alignment, through the embodiment and understanding. And I think also being uh, ready to say no, 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 like, no, that's not okay. Um, And I think as we're seeing more and as I'm doing a technique, my next technique for next month is about this. It's to remove the explosive trigger (laughs) that is inside of us that has been, you know, mm-hmm. that suppresses, 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 mm-hmm. and then the misogyny is there mm-hmm. and the all of that happens. And then there's this, you know, big mm-hmm. volcanic thing that comes up, which is still a great, you know, I'm still all for it. But it's just removing that pressure valve, mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, letting off some pressure and just being, okay, we are seen now, you are seen. And all of that stuff that the feminine knows how to do, which is in the softness or the, it could be the mystery or it could be, uh, oh, I had um, actually uh, a really dear friend of mine uh, recently talk about this and say, you know, that she had shared that, you know, to her business team that, you know, they had a plan in a certain way, um, but that uh, that plan may change. And she's going to use words like, I feel... Mm -hmm. I heard, I felt, I sensed, I saw, you know, Mm -hmm. so she was using these words, talking to, um, you know, talking to her team and just Mm -hmm. saying, you know, 
Owning it. Yeah, owning it. Yep. Just own it. Yep. And the th- but the beautiful thing is, is that the masculine ultimately really knows that mm-hmm. and is just waiting for us to give the cue, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only thing is, is that that's the way the game was designed before now. Mm-hmm. So that that was the fishbowl we were in, right? Mm-hmm. That was the game they were playing. So, um, yeah, I think... Again, you know, the the embodiment is very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. And um, I think embodiment is the is the biggest thing because when you I say this all the time, there is nothing more beautiful than a being that knows itself. Mm-hmm. That's it. Mm-hmm. So for those listening that hear mirror work and are like, I could never do that. Mm-hmm. I would be like the critic would come online. Mm-hmm. What was your journey with that? Did you have a critic that you sort of had to love and integrate? Or do you have a process where sometimes you feel that critic or that um, that form come through where you're like, oh, that's not me, you know, thinking I look this way or thinking I am I should be something different? Yeah, I wouldn't. I'd say when I began doing mm-hmm. the mirror work, I was a lot older in years. Like definitely I had more critic in younger years. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I would say is that um, it's been delightful because I have all different embodiments of myself come that are from other planets mm-hmm. that look, I mean, th- you wouldn't say they were pretty in mm-hmm. this realm, which I always joke with myself and I'm like, oh, you should be kinder, you know, be mm-hmm. a little kinder because, you know, you could have like, you know, mm-hmm. yep. elephant skin or yeah, whatever, or like, you know, whatever it is, be a and whatever. Dolphin head. Yeah, dolphin head <laughs> yep. and be like, yeah, great. Uh-huh. No, so, um, but what it has been is just expansive. And when I teach this on retreat and the people that have studied with me, um, I would just encourage to keep going towards it Mm -hmm. because you can't, you can't run away from it. Mm -hmm. So then shorten the time, do it for a minute Mm -hmm. or then do it for three minutes. And pretty soon, I mean, I don't want to ruin the experience and everybody's different, but oftentimes you see a lot, like Mm -hmm. lots of stuff come in. So we're focusing on the third eye gently and you have your gaze gently and you're just, you're endeavoring to keep your eyes open, but you won't be able to because they'll start to sting. So then you'll shut them and open them up. But you're, you're intending to hold a fixed gaze on your mm-hmm. third eye, breathing, breathing, breathing. And then you can add a mantra to that, like, mm-hmm. you know, let it be beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that's my favorite mantra. But you know, you could you could add anything that you anything that you want to redirect in your like, you know, I'm divine. There's only one of me in the entire universe. I am here. I'm embodied. Thank you. The gratitude mm-hmm. to the body. You know, and that's the other thing. Our bodies are going through so much mm-hmm. right now. And just to be in the body and to, you know, be doing self-care treatments, however that is. And I had one that I wanted to share, actually, mm-hmm. my favorite. Um, is this Abiyanga oil massage mm-hmm. is literally a game changer. And I'm going to suggest organic sesame oil, mm-hmm. but that could change depending on your body type. Mm-hmm. If you're more kapha, you might do a coconut oil, mm-hmm. or you know, if it was summer, you might do a coconut oil mm-hmm. if it was really hot. But in general, sesame oil, you know, can be pretty good for as a good general for most people. But what you want to do is um at least one time a week, heat that oil in a double boiler. I do it in like a French press. Mm -hmm. So just hot water inside the French press without the top on it and then put the organic oil in. It'll heat up very quickly. Um, And you need to have a lot of towels because it's very slippery, but get in your shower or your bath and just know that you're going to get a ton of oil on those towels and make sure you're not slipping. But start with a self-oil massage Mm. and pour it over your scalp. Really, really massage it in, you know, down your throat, over all your chakra systems, your spine. And as you start to rub your body, start to speak to your body as Mm. if it was a living intelligence, which it is, and tell yourself how much you love yourself, how grateful you are, and really just take a moment to commune with who you are get the bottoms of your feet, you know, and it's about 20 minutes, the oil will start to absorb. And then after that, before you turn on the hot water, first put shampoo in your hair. So you've got oil in your hair, right? Put the shampoo 
right on your hair first with no water and get it sort of distributed in there and then turn on a hot shower and you're going to try to stay in for like 10 minutes as hot as you can stand it. Your pores will open up and that oil goes into your sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous Mm. system. You'll then be able to wash your hair because you put the shampoo in first. If you don't do it this way, you won't get the oil out. It'll be not fun. So just go ahead and rinse it all out, wash your hair. In about 45 minutes, your entire nervous system will drop three stories and you'll feel like you had a four hour massage. So do this if you're traveling, do this if you're stressed, do this, um, you know, at least once a week, if you can, if you can get it, it will literally reduce your aging mechanism because it will bring that cortisol Mm -hmm. and that fight or flight just all the way down. Plus your skin is soft and supple and you can add, of course, I like adding sandalwood Mm -hmm. into it or rose. And this is a really great practice to fall in love with your body. Um, Try it. It's like the anointing. I think it was the night before Jesus was on the cross and Mary, that was her offering to Jesus was the rinsing with oil, like a very expensive oil that created this perfume within the house, you know, the Mm. offering of the feminine to Mm. like, just be there in presence with beauty and with scent and sensory experience. So it's powerful to be able to anoint yourself in that way and really just be, it's almost like you allow yourself to be taken over. You know, like how can you allow your highest self to sort of guide the experience of loving, loving oneself in that moment? So. Within the rising of the feminine, you mentioned it before, and I think about this quite a bit, there's going to be anger that comes up (laughs) and rage. (laughs) What is the process of working Mm. with anger and rage Mm. as a feminine? You know, I had a COVID death experience in Mm. May. (laughs) It mimicked a a death experience that I had in India 12 years ago. It was a spiral return experience. So I had none of the lungs or cold. I just had extreme body aches. Mm -hmm. And it coincided with a ritual that I did um, with Dom and her where um, we offered our bodies to the healing of the planet for one week. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling so strong and awesome. I'd been skiing in Mammoth and I was just rocking it. Pilates. I was like, I'm so healthy. I'm so good. <laughs> I'm a vision. I'm like, I'm so good. Yes. I'm like, yeah, I'll put myself in that ritual. Why not? 100%. You know? So I put myself in the ritual and I was literally on the sacred mountain in front of my house, which is a twin to Arunachala, which is um, the mountain where Sri Ramana Maharshi walked mm-hmm. and lived his entire life. Not his entire, well, since he was 16, realized. And for for some divine reason, the mountain that I was brought to is a twin. So I'm very connected to that lineage. And uh, it's been called out by different, different Indian masters over the years. So anyway, I was on the mountain unsuspecting. And when the clock struck 1201 Italian time, which is where the ritual was officiated, I was like, God, my lower back's really killing me. So, um, so that was really, really crazy. But what was interesting was leading up to that, I experienced a flare-up of misogyny um, mm. in my life, I'll just say, uh, in business from other women. I guess so, the thing is, is women looking out for internalized misogyny you know, with being super mindful. Mm -hmm. I'm always about how we can take responsibility. And it's Mm -hmm. like, yes, the men and the masculine, of course, but how can we take responsibility for that encoding within us? It it happens. I mean, it happens Mm -hmm. all the time and it happens with me frequently. Mm. So it's like, I'm at a, like I'm at a women's summit, right? You can only imagine. I can't, I I can't. You can. I mean, it, it was... It was just ridiculous. It, yeah, it's it was comical. so ridiculous that I just had to laugh. My eyes are watering because it's so true Cause, cause and it's felt so true. Yes, no, and so and upside I mean, down world. And it, it's like the um, it's like as women we don't see it when we're mm. doing it directly to another woman. I mean, it's it's just uh, it's staggering, mm-hmm. quite quite frankly. Um, 
So, but what was interesting, so, so I'll, I'm going to tell you this whole, I think the listeners will yes. get this because this is like, okay, so I went on spiritual mission 12 years ago to India and everyone that knows me, they're like, oh, Julie, you must be, go to India all the time. I'm like, no, I don't go to India all the time. I don't want to go there. I remember what it was like before and I don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. But then one morning I woke up and it was like, go to India. Mm-hmm. So I went um, and I went right to Abrenachala, which is the mm-hmm. twin mountain that's in front of my mm-hmm. house. And a friend of mine had given me a mantra to chant before going up. And I was going to connect with Sri Ramana Maharshi, who was realized at age 16 from a fear of death. And he was one of the highest vibrating yogis. He didn't even really teach. He just radiated. And his um, guidance was self-inquiry. Who am I? So he was like, there is only one self. There is no other. And so he lived and walked on this mountain for 10 years that looks exactly like the mountain that I hike on all the time. So um, he had some caves there. And so I wanted to get to those caves. Mm -hmm. So I had this big talisman at the time. It was these big Rudrakshas with this uh, beaded altar that I know was mine from another life. Like I saw it and I had to get it. And I had taken it all around with me and all these masters and teachers had always called me up to look at it. They always wanted to talk about Mm -hmm. it. They wanted to tell me about it. Mm -hmm. So I took this on the mountain and and got when I when I went up in the morning, my guide was drunk when he came. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) And then amazing. And then I was like, wow, thanks. Yeah, literally. You're like, good. Thank you for showing me like polarity. (laughs) Exactly. So then we started hiking on the mountain, but there were monkeys the size of small children there. I was just watching him and he was just ignoring them, acting like they weren't there. So I was like, okay, I'll just do what he Mm -hmm. does. And there were different sadhus living, you know, that live there under bushes or trees or whatever. And so I got into uh, one of his caves and I there was a Sri Yantra um, altar, which is the, you know, the mandala that is a representation of all life. It's a very famous yogic uh, Mm -hmm. symbol, but this one was a 3D. So it was a sculpture. Mm -hmm. It comes, you know, up. And so I had to jump and I took my big talisman and I offered it over the top of it. And I said, this is the last thing between me and God. Like I was just, and all of a sudden I came onto a full blown acid trip but I hadn't taken any acid, Mm -hmm. but I know what acid feels Mm -hmm. like because I've taken acid Mm -hmm. (laughs) when I was in my teens. Mm -hmm. So I am blazing, literally being burned from the inside out. And there is a 5,000 year old Shiva temple right in front of me. And I'm not going in it because all I hear is get out of India, get out of India, get out of India. Mm -hmm. So I've been on Indian, I've been, I've been on Indian soil for three days and I'm going back to my hotel blazing on an acid trip, Mm -hmm. trying to book a flight home. So I get a flight home, but I have to drive four hours in the middle of the night to Bangalore and I'm by myself and I'm blazing. And I start yelling at my guides, my teams, my Vedic teams that are very around me. I'm part of that lineage. And I'm just like, it's not your life. It's my fucking life. Mm -hmm. Like, what am I doing here? Like, I, like, I didn't have to do that. You know, I mean, just like, I was like, this is not you. This is me. Like, mm-hmm. like I was thinking like, what am I doing here? Like I had little kids and I'm like across the world. And so I got to my gate in Bangalore my stomach hurt so bad. And one of my guides that I've worked with for years, a woman appeared in another realm and she started pulling things off me. I had all these attachments on me and I was afraid to let them know that I wasn't well. Cause I was afraid they wouldn't let me get on the plane. Mm-hmm. So my friend's stepdad had forced me to take this halcyon tablet. Mm-hmm. He was like, take it, take it. You can sleep. I'm like, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. Mm-hmm. But I took it. I didn't, I didn't ingest it. I had it with me. Thank fucking God I had that halcyon. I got on the flight. I had to go from Bangalore to London and then London to LA. But just getting out of India mm-hmm. was the key. So I took that halcyon or whatever it was mm-hmm. and slept. And I got home. And when I came in, I collapsed in my family's arms and my son Tyler made me pasta. We're talking about embodiment. It was that pasta meal that got me back in my body. And I found out later through ceremony and session what I had done. And my guide said, let us tell you what you did in India. 
So when you go on spiritual mission, you don't get to know all the things because you would fail. You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you would not succeed. Obviously, I would not have gone there if I knew what I was dealing with. But part of what I did, I had a meeting with 12 aspects of myself Mm. to meet, and I had to be on the earth, on the land. So they threw the energy and I caught it. But what I also did by that movement is I pulled a foundational support out of the guru abuse against women in India. So you can imagine the lineage of energy that came for me when I did that. So just got chills again. Thank you. Thanks for the this confirmation. So we arrived back into COVID land. Okay. So now we're in now time space, everyone. Mm-hmm. Come with me. Yes. Okay. So I'm on that sacred mountain that is a twin to Ramana Maharshi. And in my recent months, I've been very connected to Dominher and Falco, the master guide. So I've been working with Falco and not really connected to the Vedic so much. I always am, but not so much. So um, here I had, right before I got COVID, experienced severe misogyny. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling when I had COVID, the rage of the planet, like volcanic. Like I was feeling the rage of every woman that has been annihilated in this planetary realm. It was coming out of my pores, the smoke. I was so angry, so upset. Mm -hmm. And some of that looked at me calling out business people, just full on, you know, mm-hmm. no sweetness, no kindness, mm-hmm. no, I'm talking mother lion volcano, you know, mm-hmm. let, let me call that out really how it is. And so I did do that. But I even received uh, during my COVID pain, which I was um, so down and looking, I, I had a lot of conversations with the void. And I felt as if my life had been um, like even being a mother. I was like, did it, did it really, uh, you know, create what I had hoped? Um, does, can I count on anyone? There's no one that I can count on. It's what I've been thinking about lately. Okay. So this is important that we're, mm-hmm. cause I, cause I talked to a lot of people after that and they were like same, but they hadn't told anyone. Mm-hmm. So I was just having this conversation with this blackness going, okay, it's you and me. And at one point I was like, what is the thing that you have to take to kill yourself? Like, mm-hmm. what is the, mm-hmm. I didn't get to the computer board, but I was, that's the state I was in. And, you know, I had my family there and people were taking care of me, but it was this feeling just that nothing matters mm-hmm. in, in this space. Dom and her had been contacting me, their physician, warning me that, that COVID has this depressive aspect mm-hmm. that is not natural to this planet, as we, many of us have had that experience. So anyway, but again, let's keep this poison into wine. I have a lyric in one of my songs on my new album that I'm recording this year, poison into wine. So what do I do as a mystic and what do we do as mystics? We transform poison into wine. So this was in fact a very sacred moment, although a very dark moment. So I rose out of it. Before I rose out of it though, I received a deck from a very dear friend of mine. <laughs> I can't even say that. I, I, let's just say I had another communication from a friend just seeped in misogyny. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And this is a really good friend of mine, Mm -hmm. like someone who I know loves me deeply. Mm -hmm. But so I had to call that out. So I get home after calling that out. And the person just was like, you know, I'm, I love you. Like I didn't even understand. Like it just went exactly perfect. Like so great. The best feeling. Yeah. So I was like, oh, you know, it's so nice. So I get back home, I fall asleep and I wake up to a YouTube video because I'm still quite sick, of Yogananda has his hand on Sri Ramana Maharshi's shoulder. And it's a documentary about Sri Ramana Maharshi. But I wasn't watching YouTube. I rarely watch YouTube. Like, I, I don't know how this came up on my, on my thing. And there they were. And suddenly I remembered the mountain, see, because I hadn't been in touch with that. I was like, oh, my mountain is this energy of Ramana Maharshi. The yogi lineage is here for me. They're always here for me. I am that. And 
they are the shelter from the storms and they're here. Like they're like reminding me of my lineage in that, in that branch. All of a sudden the door knock, knock on the door. I open the door of my bedroom and my son Tyler hands me a bowl of kitchery. And he says, mom, I made you kitchery. Well, Tyler hasn't made me kitchery in four years. We didn't communicate. He didn't know what I was experiencing at all. And he's the one that made me the pasta 12 years ago in that same moment. Mm -hmm. So it was just like all the players were there and it was very profound. And what that did for me, and maybe this is what your experience is doing for you, is it brought into laser focus what is essential. What is essential? And so going back to what are we hiding from? What parts of ourselves have we not climbed into? Have we not given life force to? And what is essential? And for me, it's music. So I'm a devotional singer. I recorded two albums with my boys. And I'm an entrepreneur in multidimensional, so I'm doing 9,000 other things. You know, I have an amazing plant-based cheese company, Shrimu, which is great. Uh, but that whole experience for me I'm a musician first. So I wake up a musician, I go to bed a musician, but I'm still doing everything else I'm doing and more. Um, but it also just helped really clarify. And this life is precious. You know, we're going through our walk-in. Some people are dropping their bodies to go in their walk-in. They're walking in another place. So if we're alive in a body, if we're here now and you're listening to this podcast and you're connected to this frequency, this is a divine privilege. And so what is essential is key. And then the last piece is finding the joy, the celebration, the ease. And that comes in the devotion of knowing that we are not alone. We are not alone in this. And that we are held, you know, the great story, we're held even when we think, even in the moment where we think we're abandoned you know, of Yeshua, of th th that mm -hmm. story. So um, COVID was big for me. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be anything else for you. You know <laughs> what I mean? It wouldn't be anything else but that. Do you feel like you call yourself a, mus a musician because that's the closest you are to the divine, like your divine self? Do you feel like your most divine self within? Mm -hmm. I think I do. I mean, there's definitely something, and it's also in the word, it's also in my words. It's, it's not a personality decision. Again, it's my life print. Mm -hmm. My words carry a transmission. Mm -hmm. And when they transmit, they shift the energy. Mm -hmm. and, and again, it's not like I was like, I want to speak. It's just the way it is. So when I sing, it's the same thing. And sound transmission is, is the most powerful force because you don't have to have an ideology or believe or, you know, it's, none, it's not coming from that. And um, one of the things that I discovered recently was Mel from mm -hmm. Conscious City Guide. She said to say hi, by the way. Um, she uh, got me a astrocartography yes. reading. Have you done that? Yep. It's okay. powerful. Yeah, I'd never done it. It's yep. when your astrology is connected to geography. Yep. And what my, one of my things, my identities came up. She was like, you're a poet. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow. I was like, I never really realized that. I mean, I like writing lyrics, but I had never really sort of gone there. So um, I, I know that I have a big body of work to do in music mm -hmm. and I have um, 10 tracks that I'm collaborating with Juliana Smaltz. Her mm -hmm. name, she's She Bloom and she's in her 20s and she wrote some tracks for me and it's been an amazing collab. Um, so it's just something that is sort of, yeah, that, that chord that connects me to the divine. It's such a pure level. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm really looking forward to that whole expression of music videos and vinyls mm -hmm. and um, just really being able to storytell through that medium. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's quite paradigm breaking to be mm -hmm. 60 years old and, you know, going into that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just writing my own experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have excess mirrors in my house. We have a powder room with no mirror. Mm. I have one really good mirror where I look amazing. Why is that? Because, you know, there's like tribes that live on the planet, you know, like let's say mm -hmm. over 
200 years or even older. And it's because they're not looking. Think of quantum reality. Mm -hmm. You're looking at who you are and you're creating that reality. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're, that what you're viewing, what your perspective is gazing at is what you want to create. Mm -hmm. So again, going into the narrative on the planet of, you know, how we're all fucked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a, a friend of mine too recently tell me, um, he's like, Julie, we only have two, two years left of water. And I was like, dude, yeah, I, mean, come on. I was like, dude, we got to quantum this thing. Yeah, I go, we got a Jedi. It. Mm -hmm. Like, come on. He's like, I need to call you. I'm like, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, whatever it is, you know, we, we are eternal beings. Mm -hmm. There is no death. And of course I'm not separated from the suffering that is happening mm -hmm. on our planet and the, you know, our humanity in Pakistan. And, you know, this is not a small situation we're in. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I hold for and pray for is the least amount of suffering, mm -hmm. you know, like let us wake up without suffering mm -hmm. and let those people that transition in those places feel the arms of the divine mm -hmm. around them quickly. Let it be you know, let, mm -hmm. let them be held, mm -hmm. you know, and I really do. I mean, I feel like when we transition, it's going to be like, yeah, and it wasn't even like that. Mm -hmm. Like it was, you know, uh, but again, uh, you know, talking about these things, I always, I go back to a very human level. And when I, when I guide people and work with people, it's, I am not, I am in no way disconnected mm -hmm. from the suffering of humanity. And I am eternally grateful for all of the gentleness in my life, the love, mm -hmm. the care, the freedom, you know, all of these things. So, um, you know, being devoted, I think is the secret sauce mm -hmm. and it is what will keep you guided and safe and cared for and on track and allow you to cultivate uh, more unconditional love mm -hmm. because there is no life form that is better or worse than any other. And this includes, uh, anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, a homeless person, someone, you know, it's not about success and our mm -hmm. paradigm. I mean, the story is just old and tired. Mm -hmm. Like so many people have achieved success and that's just not mm -hmm. it. So within your own life print, what is it that brings you joy? Mm -hmm. What brought you joy at the age of six mm -hmm. as a child? And how can you cultivate that love around her mm -hmm. and really support her mm -hmm. to be all that she is? And then coming back to the relationship you know, I've been sharing with Rich a lot of my dreams that, you know, he doesn't know, you know, there's a lot of things that we still don't know about each other, but we are committed to supporting each other to realize our individual dreams. Mm -hmm. And that was what our wedding vows were. Mm. Um, years ago when years you first ago. got married. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's funny how like, yeah, you're even psychic at that time. You're saying like, I felt like with my wedding, I was saying things and I understood energetically what they meant. But over time, you're like, whoa, I was speaking to this thing that I didn't even really see as clearly as I see now, given given the time. You said something I want to kind of explore a little bit around your guides. So when you're in India, you're like talking to your guides, you're like, this is my life. And you're being very clear and very almost angry. I think a lot of people are scared to be as like direct with their guides. They feel like they have to be like tender and soft and that they're almost like in service to the guides. What's your relationship with your guides and, and how would you suggest people cultivate a relationship that feels really real and authentic and helpful? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, one thing that's important for us to remember is that just because a being has like a light body or they can float through the walls or they can bilocate doesn't mean that they're more evolved mm -hmm. than you are. They could be, but it's not, it's not, it's not an, an automatic. And so when we start to expand spiritually, and this is something that we need to be responsible about, is that dark forces can use an energy and they can appear mm -hmm. as different things. And so our main mission as humans on the planet is sovereignty. It's up to you. What are you taking responsibility for? And have you given your sovereignty to a government, to a medical system, to a guide, to a religion, to a spiritual guru? It's not about the guru. The guru is gone now. We're not in that age. We are in the community. So in, within the community, in order to be a, a worthy, valued member, you must be embodied in who you are because you have unique gifts that only you can share. And if you're alive in a body, that's a sacred privilege. So 
Um, no one has the right to be in your energy field without your consent. I am not an advocate of channel channeling. Mm -hmm. It can be great. It's fine. Mm -hmm. I've been to many, you know, many are very good and, and, and they can be wonderful, but I'm just saying this is about you being you. And that's what water tiger is about you being you, who are you? Are you embodied? And if you are sovereign and embodied, I'm going to wager, I'm just going to bet that you're going to bless creation, you know, because you will feel seen and alive and connected. So that time I was in, you know, I was dying. I was experiencing a death that was not gentle. Um, and I couldn't see from my vantage point that I was being attacked. I didn't even know mm -hmm. at the time how big that was. Um, but I was yelling at them because in a human form, I was a mother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the humanity is just as important as the divinity. In fact, the humanity is the divinity. So there isn't a separation. This is what my, one of my missions that was described to me is the work that I'm doing is I am creating energetic experiences that merge the physical and the spiritual into unity so that humanity doesn't have to evolve separated anymore. So that's one of my big through lines that's in my four tracks of work that I'm doing. Shrimu is one of those. The music is one of those. Water Tiger is one of those. Um, so, and movement actually, funny enough, is one of those. So, um, so with the guides, uh, just because you're in a human body, you are not less than any guide. And um, that we have to remember because if we become like Stepford children or wives, uh, we can be um, deceived, manipulated. So it's all about sovereign right. You are a sovereign right, a sovereign right mm -hmm. to be free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's different aspects of that. And we do need community. So when I say my guides, those are like my lineage, the beings that have been around me, but they're, they're, they're separate people. Like mm -hmm. I've been incarnated with them in other lifetimes. You know, we've been in human bodies before, but understanding also that the human body is a, we're the ground crew. So without us, there's no team. So again, think of it like that. We're the ground crew. So sometimes if it's too much communication or you're not sleeping or you're traveling too much at night, you know, it's like, hey, you know, breaks. Mm -hmm. And I know for myself, my mission was altered because during that nine-year financial collapse, there came a moment where I was maybe, you know, contemplating leaving my body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know what I had planned for myself, probably something really dumb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. But I'm glad, you know, they were like, okay, too much, too much, too much. Mm -hmm. Like we got to back off a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, you know, we are divinely human. And I think this moment in time is about the reclamation of the original founder, uh, lineage, I'll call it life print, which is directly connected to, to Yeshua to, mm -hmm. but not in a, not in any religious form. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's the fact that as a founder race, we are eternal. Um, we, many of us pair in genetic equals. So if any of you have not met your mate and you've been suffering, um, this is appearing in the planetary field, in the architecture of the planet and beyond. These pairings are coming forth. So it happens in the macro first, and then it comes into the micro. So I would start journaling. You were talking about journaling mm -hmm. in the podcast that I listened to. Journaling about what would that feel like? What would a genetic equal partner even feel like? Mm -hmm. Have you ever even considered a possibility? So this means some of us are going to be mm -hmm. stepped up, leveled up, or expanded out. Uh, some of us are going to change. Some of us are going to meet that person, you know, that we've been waiting for our whole life. But I, I mean, I've seen it like at an, at a, at a mass level, mm. not just like one thing. So it, it is happening. So the only thing we can all be sure for is there's a lot of change that's mm -hmm. going to go on. It's almost like Moses, you know, with the, it's like animals going two by two. Mm. It's like finding their genetic match before the flood. 
That's so cool. You know what I mean? It's mm. like, okay, how are we finding that person or that being that's going to be that like divine mm. partner through mm. this process or through this ascension? Yeah. And the other part of it that's interesting, you know, that is beyond like a human relationship. So yeah. think about if that energetic creates a certain vibration, the impact of the planetary elevation by those pairings coming together. So it's it has nothing to do with human ridiculous reasons that we break up. Mm -hmm. It's big reasons. And this embodiment is coming in. I had another friend of mine had a flatlined COVID fever, flatlined and near death experience, going to the light, completely psyched. Yeah, I was going to say. And then she was pulled back by a loved one Oof. and calls me and she's like, I could only call you. She's like, this happened. I'm not the same. And I saw her last week. She's not the same. She's amazing. She's still, she's still her, but something else arrived. Mm -hmm. And are they more connected or less? Oh, way more. More, like, okay. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. Oh, do you mean partner? Yeah. No, no, I'm talking within her body. Okay. Just her body. Okay. Yeah. Because I was going to say, I'm like, because if a loved one's kind of, you're at the light, you're like, yes, here we no, go. Yes. And then your yes. loved one, you're like, don't yeah. do this to me. No, no, no. It was it was good. But what was interesting to her was that um, she didn't have any, any worry, mm. you know, and she has children and she has like, it was very yes. bizarre you know, cause it, all it was, was beauty. And then it was like, no, no, no. And she could hear people screaming for her. But then when, when I saw her, I mean, it's, it, you just, you can see it mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. Like it's a strength. Mm -hmm. It's a presence. It's a, it's a weight mm -hmm. is what I want to say. Mm -hmm. A weight of wisdom and presence. Mm -hmm. And so I feel, and this is maybe someone who, you know, admittedly, from her, she has sort of turned a blind eye to her spirituality. Mm -hmm. Like she knows she can heal with her hands, mm -hmm. but she's been doing the party like something else. Mm -hmm. And so what the thing that's so beautiful about it is that this just arrived for her. And now she's, you know, she's, she's a different person. So the thing wow. is, is that that energy will come for you mm -hmm. no matter where you are in the appropriate time in the appropriate manner. So mm -hmm. Um, it's really an individual journey of, you know, realization that, it, of course, and then we're all the same life. Mm -hmm. So, something you mentioned about Tyler bringing you the pasta and then the kitchery. I had kitchery last night. There's nothing like mm -hmm. it in the world. Um, but I want to transition and talk about Shrimu and the energetics of food. Mm -hmm. And especially during these times when there's so much change, so much happening, and so much light being brought to the planet, the body is very much in an upgrade phase. So I'd love to talk about food as a spiritual tool. Mm -hmm. um, what is it, what's your experience or what is your belief around the importance of food? And then I want to go into like the process of growing, cultivated, being mm -hmm. with your food and all the intentionality you bring to Shrimu. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's really everything, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it? And I mentioned before that as women, we were keepers of the flame. The flame was in the hearth of the home, mm -hmm. which was in the kitchen. So that is the spiritual, that is it. Mm -hmm. And interesting enough, after I became further connected with Dom and her, one of their powerful rituals is ritual of the forum and it's through the food. Mm -hmm. So I had already been made, you know, creating all these recipes for all these years. Um, and of course we know that the mother's love seeped in the food or the father's love also seeped in the food. Um, so it's the intentionality which can start to expand. So, you know, of course, we bless the hands that make it, then Mother Earth who who provides all the ingredients. Um, but there's a deeper communion that can be had, and that is that in the previous eons of time, we were in community with trees. We were in community with animals. We were in, com in community with the elements. And so it's starting to open up that communication in a much more intentional way. We have the, um, you know, the joke, oh, you're a tree hugger. Like that's kind of what's in our consciousness. But if you really consider trees, they are some of the oldest beings in this realm. And they are the masters of community. They share water and nutrients under the soil. And they have much more to share with us. Um, so part of the thing that I've sort of evolved into is that 
Um, I'm, I don't chef very much at all, but uh, when I do, it's only in prayer. And so I cultivate an altar. So I would suggest just bringing that awareness into your kitchen. So most of us in a modern sense, we're cooking, there's a podcast on, there's a TV Mm -hmm. on, there's, um, you know, someone looking at their phone with like, you know, weird audio. Mm -hmm. It's like all of that goes into the food. So it's creating an altar in your kitchen and I don't let anyone come in that is not prepared to enter. So um, when you when you take it to that level and then it's simply an intense desire to commune with the forces of nature that bring these elements together, then it is the devotion of the servant or the server being the channel or the flow of this current. But then using the shamanic ability of being a healer or a guide to actually program the food to serve each individual that is going to be tasting this food in the highest manner for them because it's not a Mm one-stop shop. And then it's about making it with joy and love. And when you present it, taking the extra step to add the garnish of flowers, even if it's just you, even even if you're by yourself, but really consider What are the elements that would go on that plate that would make it a devotional offering? How can you elevate it more? And I guarantee you, if you cook like that and you serve that, the next thing is though, how does the person consuming the food receive the food? Mm -hmm. So then there's that relationship. So at the beginning, you might start, you know, one or three of these practices that I just said. And start to notice how the people feel when they're eating the food. Um, And then the next element is explaining that you prepared this food. And maybe you eat for the first 15 minutes in silence. Or just maybe just 10 minutes and taste everything on the plate in silence. And receive it. Allow your body to register that this is sacred mana that is coming in. Um, Another thing that I do is I light ceremonial fires. So what I can do, um, like let's say whole fruits or vegetables or nuts or seeds or shrimu, um, I have that as prasad by the fire. So that fire infuses the food with whatever the ceremony that I did. And then using those, they become like prasad, which is sacred um, a sacred mana, mm-hmm. sa- sacred gift that's given. Yeah. And that's the, you know, just to, for people that might not understand, because I understand it, but it's, would you say that it's the energetics? Everything is energy. Is this the belief? Everything is energy and that is being infused. Yeah. And again, I don't use, I'm, I'm not a believer. I, I believe, I don't believe in anything. So it's the dance with the energy Mm -hmm. and it's the devotion. So what really matters is if you can feel your heart, if everybody everybody can just feel your heart for a moment and feel the place where you first feel inside. You know, there's a portal right there. Mm -hmm. Like when you see that puppy, you know where that point is. Mm -hmm. So it's connecting with that point and just really being a vessel you know, a servant, let me, let me serve these elements and gratitude and connection. Thank you for the elements, the wind, the sunlight today, this beautiful planet, you know? Um, yeah. With Srimu, this is my last question. You know, you're so intentional about the process. What is so important about that intentionality? And can you talk a little bit about it? Cause it's such a good example. And I was telling Lindsay, I'm like, there's such layers to things. You know, there's like giving 1% back and there's recyclable packaging. And then there's Shremu, which is just (laughs) next level intentionality. So can you talk about the intentionality? Yeah, well, you know, as you guys know from listening to this podcast by now. um, So everything that I do is an expression of of that one. And it's all for a return to that connection. So Shremu is not just a not cheese product in a box. It's a global mission of awakening and it's a devotional offering for life. So my prayer in that, in Shrimu, is that you will eat it, whoever's consuming it, will know themselves more. 
will fall in love with themselves more. So I'm not trying to convince you that, you know, my way of living is a good way. I'm honoring that nature that is inside of you. And I'm, and I'm giving it all of my love to nourish it, unconditional love. So I don't care if you eat meat. I don't care if you eat chicken. I, I mean, meat is chicken. I don't know why I said that. I don't care wh- how you eat. Uh, that's not my business. I have nothing to say about that. I just know that I'm, I'm infusing this product. It is plant-based. It is better for our planet. Mm. It is kinder to our animals. It is more loving for your body, better for our children. Um, I'm very sensitive stomach. I, I can't eat a handful of nuts. I get sick. These are cured. They're cultured. Mm. The cheese is fantastic. It's, it tastes so good. Um, but then what I did in, my, in, our, in our kitchen facility, um, I have had very good uh, juju uh, in that I have attracted my spiritual cosmic family has been finding me. And we have a pretty, like I just had a team lunch at Cafe Gratitude a couple of weeks ago and I just left with my heart just exploding at these individuals. Mm. So most of them have heard me on podcasts. They've followed me for years and they're really, they really mean it. They know I really mean it. Um, and so I call the people, I gave them the title of sacred maker. Mm. And I gave them the title of sacred maker the first day they started because I'm not in the business of making somebody have to prove, I know they are divine right now. And we know in the yogi system and in spiritual awareness that who prepares your food affects the taste of it. It affects the vibration of it. And so in the kitchen, we don't touch the cheese until we've done a breathing meditation practice. And then we have nature sounds, you know, birds chirping, winds, rains, you know, we create an ambience as much as we can. And we, it, we diffuse orange blossom essences into the air. So we're just creating this intention um, that goes beyond the ingredients. And we're working with many Davic realms. Mm-hmm. I'm communicating with the trees that source our nuts. Um, I feed Shrimu to the fire often. Um, we have a lot of help. We have a lot of this magical kingdom that is assisting us in this global mission of awakening. And so Shrimu is really about community and it's a very different thing. And so even in the financial raise, like the, the business side, um, I am not a plant-based venture, you know, mm-hmm. form. Um, I basically um, created a, a ceremonial circle with crystals Mm -hmm. and I'm calling my cosmic family who are, you know, liquid and fluid and can come in and support in these ways. And the big why of Shrimu is to fund this expansion at the spiritual community of Dominher. Um, They have these underground temples Mm -hmm. that are basically altars to humankind and all the species on the planet, 7,000 square feet but it's only 20% of the operation. And so 80% is on top of that. Took them 20 years to get permits and it's an $88 million living Akashic record. Mm. Um, It will be like a museum to house the indigenous DNA of the planet. Mm. And why is that important? Because as a humanity, we must receive all of our peoples. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the big why of Shrimu. And along the way, you know, we're building community within our subscription. We've opened up to wholesale in a very limited way with, you know, smaller stores. But we're moving to Crosstown Concourse in Memphis. Mm -hmm. I signed the lease. And so we're going to be starting a community there in our facility, our first Shrimu Wine and Cheese Cafe. Amazing. Yeah. I'm so excited. And we are working, uh, collaborating with um, Tom Shadiak, the cool. film director from Memphis Rocks. So our wow. intention is to really provide a life track for as many of those kids as we can. So it's inner city youth mm-hmm. in Memphis. Um, and Tom invested $10 million and built a climbing gym there that is also a community called Memphis Rocks. Mm-hmm. So there's great stuff happening in Memphis. Crosstown Concourse is an amazing community of artists and music and refugee-owned cafes and prison reform-run mm-hmm. pizzerias. And we're so we're going there to really create a new story. 
So it, Shrimu is not about a product on a, just about a product mm -hmm. on a shelf. It's much more than that. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I'm so grateful for the product. It's so incredible and you can feel it. It's almost like this reverence, like you're like this energy comes into your life and you're like, okay, how are we going to work together in this? I would love in closing, you know, if you'd be willing, just thinking about the transitions that we're going through as a planet, thinking about all the people that are listening that um, might need prayers. Yeah. Would you be willing to offer of a course. prayer to our amazing community? Well, I would just love that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for asking. Oops. So let's go ahead and find ourselves. Uh, hopefully, if you're driving, you can do this. You can just listen. Don't close your eyes if you're driving. So let's just find ourselves in a meditative position. And I'm going to open the field in sacred service to the law of one. And as we ignite throughout all timelines, all realities, all dimensions, and the void, we ask, command, and intend for the highest exchange according to the will of our future selves embodied in each individual listening to this podcast. Beloved creation, please hear our prayers. Please hear our cry. Please hear our heart's deepest desires. And beloveds, as we relax our bellies and relax your body, allow your body to be in a receiving posture feeling yourself safe and held in this space and allowing yourself to relax into knowing that you are held, that all is well, and that there is a magnificent, omniscient divine force that is orchestrating this play that we are all playing a part in. And so know that you are guided, you are loved, and you are valued. And I'm going to ask the teams to please open all channels of light, all aspects of guidance, of comfort, of nourishment, of communication, and of loving support to each divine, unique life form. Let us receive all that is needed for the realization of our highest sheroic probability, for our highest heroic probability. And as we feel ourselves aligning into what is true for each one of us, we want to ignite the qualities of unconditional forgiveness and of unconditional forgetfulness across all barriers of separation, of right and wrong, of black and white, of this, of that. And let us be authentically embodied in the truth of who we are. And from that beauty of the being that knows itself, let us step into community let us step into life, into co-creation with the knowing that we have all that we need to create a more beautiful world. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And this is our time. So allow that to really resonate through. And I'm going to ask the teams to wrap each individual in blankets of pink light and just let everyone be held in this security and knowing we are not alone. And there are legions of life forces, beings, angels, nature spirits, all kinds of life forces that are our team mates. And they are here. They are with us. And we are all one in the eternal living light. And so it is. And so it is. Mm. So beautiful. 
Thank you. Totally transported. <laughs> <laughs> coming back down, coming back in. It was so lovely to sit with you today. It's Aww. such a pleasure. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'm just always so grateful where a conversation goes. It's just fills me up. And we're so grateful mm -hmm. to, to work with Srimu and to have Srimu in our lives. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it's you. a blessing to be here and share this time. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us. It was such a pleasure to be with you in studio. You can go to shrimu.com. It's S-R-I-M-U.com. And you can dig into all of their not cheeses. They are incredible. You can also go to juliepyatt.com to check out more information about her, to learn about the podcast, retreats, Water Tiger, and any of her books. And thank you to our sponsors for this episode. You can find all discount information in our show notes as well as on almost30.com. Come. We appreciate you all. We will see you on the next episode. Be sure to subscribe so they drop into your inbox every single week. And be sure to subscribe to our new podcast, Morning Microdose. We love you guys. Thank you so much for being a part of our lives. Thank you for being so sweet to our podcast guests and our community. We will see you on the next one. Bye. Bye. Bye.